Hello, my name as always is Emmanuel Clement and today I'm going to talk you through this sketch page that I shared sometime in February uh, because I thought that would be interesting to share with you all. Uh, this is one of my personal favorites uh, that I've um, written for practice so far, orchestration practice, and um, I thought it might be valuable to anybody interested in the craft uh, to talk through my process here and what I was doing with this particular piece. Anybody curious or or um, wanting to learn more um, should just follow along and do not worry about understanding everything or noticing everything. The key to growth and improvement is just going to be following your curiosity uh, in the things that you do notice. So relax, sit back, and uh, uh, let's dive in a little deeper. Uh, first things first, we'll play the whole thing for you, see how this sounds. Nice. Uh, that little sweet little ending in the in the winds um, is a lot happier than I originally envisioned uh, for this sketch. You'll notice up top, uh, I thought of this little idea as trying to make a decision, weighing the options, um, making up your mind. And that is why you'll hear the main idea tossed back and forth between these two sections, right? You can see uh, here, we've got the strings, and then the clarinets finish them off here. So the whole main idea is about being tossed between the sections, thinking, oh, is it like this? Oh, is it like that? Um, That's one of the uh, main things I was trying to practice in this particular sketch. In order, I want to talk about sort of how I treated the main line, then talk about the support elements, and uh, then we'll listen to the whole thing again. Uh, so what I've done already, switch over here, um, Dorico has this wonderful filtering feature where you can just select a number of parts and then make only those visible. This is great for writing through a particular section uh, on a really tall score, for instance. Um, if I want to uh, filter to just the horns to get those right, because I'm not worrying about the strings right now, um, that's really, really helpful. Uh, so here I filtered to just everyone who's playing the what I consider the main line and you'll notice it's a lot of players uh, we've got all of the winds and uh, all of the upper strings interacting with this main line at some way at some point let's hear just these players So I think now you can see and hear more clearly um, the very deliberate back and forth, right? We've got string statement, wind statement, string statement, wind statement, string statement, wind statement to finish us off. Uh, what is the most important thing to be talking about here? Well, let's talk about thickness. Um, first of all, so um, just to start, it's quite small. Oh, don't, don't go on, folks. Um, so just a little bit of a string duet and a clarinet duet. We've got the um, uh, melody line up here. Let's actually do that. Yeah. 
And then uh, their lower friends, we've got clarinet two and the viola below them, they're adding uh, thickness to this line. So these little counter elements are not supposed to be heard by themselves, right? They are making the initial statement just a little bit bolder, a little bit wider, um, giving it a little bit more weight. You can hear that. When instruments of similar timbre are working together in the same rhythm, you're generally going to hear the top of voice as the main voice. Um, and that's what I'm taking advantage of here. Uh, the strings are all a similar timbre. So let's listen to this, for example. Um, you're going to hear the top line as the most important line. And it's a nice one, if I do say so myself. Love that little slide down. That's one of my favorite bits here. Um, so when in a group of instruments of similar timbre, they're locked in rhythmically. The top voice is the one that's going to carry, be, be perceived as the main line, and everything below it uh, is just going to be adding a lot of support to that. You can hear that again with these two oboes. Right? The top line is the main line, uh, the oboe below it, just adding a, a little bit of support. Um, this was a while ago, so let me see if I can remember what I was doing with these. Yeah, it's a big, uh, um, it's a big chord. Um, the cello, I believe, just has the same. Yeah, not quite. Uh, it's mostly following the melody. Uh, at the beginning and at the end, um, but it has a little extra harmony note in the middle here. Um, because this uh, uh, this moment needs to be needs to be big. That's a nice harmony. Um, so I just needed the extra note there. But for the most part, um, the cello is just following the melody exactly. And then here we've just got some inner voices. Like I said before adding a little bit of thickness, adding a little bit of weight, right? So uh, similar to the oboes we were looking at up here, the violin two is just uh, following along at a slightly lower pitch, filling out the harmony, and then um, the violas are just doing something in the middle here. I say just doing something. I worked these harmonies out on paper um, uh, very particularly, but in principle, th this was a really important transition for me to start making as a composer. In principle, one thing is happening, right? Just this is what is happening at this particular moment. And these other lines, they may be harmonically complex or uh, but they're not contrapuntally supposed to be heard as their own independent thing this is really important um my tendency is to think really polyphonically i'm a my experience is um uh in choirs um my tendency is to think of you know okay, the soprano is interesting and independent, the alto is interesting and independent, the tenor is interesting and independent, the bass is interesting and independent, and that's actually too much information for the listener. Um, the nat, there's a, there's a little bit of a, um, a tier idea here, where the top tier, your melodic layer, that's most important, and then all the rest of this underneath it is just supportive material. You're not supposed to hear, for example, this viola line as 
independent and important by itself. You're supposed to hear it filling out this texture. Right? You can hear it if you're looking for it. Um, and I think uh, what's, what's also important to point out is that maybe you can hear it if it's missing. Right? That's uh, thinner. It's different. Here the harmony is fuller. So that viola is playing a very important role here, but it's not playing a starring role. That's so <laughs> that's so important to conceptualize, I feel like. Um, this just the melody just the melody is all that is happening here. And all of this stuff underneath it is material that is enhancing that gesture. We are uh you know making this downbeat feel bigger with a lush chord we're um making this melody more followable by having a second line follow it down uh and so on and so forth um anything else interesting oh so generally speaking um over the course of the sketch i'm moving from thin to thick so we've got a, a thin statement at first here um very thick statement here including the oboes uh and then this new statement uh the the, the um, second half of this section sounds like this so uh nice thick chord here we've got a full d minor triad i believe a d F, F, it's double third. Uh, whereas in our initial statements, we just had uh, an interval. So the idea, even though it's smaller than what we just heard, is still getting thicker and thicker as we progress. Um, and then the reply over here is quite thick as well. Um, and then finally, a very thick statement in almost all of the winds. Um, I think I, the reason I don't have oboe 2 here is because, um, I mean, oboe cuts through quite a lot. Uh, and I think to get the right sweet character, um, having both oboes in the texture was might have been a little bit too forceful. But, you know, I was writing this uh, weeks and weeks ago. I couldn't possibly remember everything uh, that I was intending at the time. Um, the flutes here are in octaves. Pretty standard. Uh, notice the um, layered dynamic here, actually. Uh, the upper flute is at a smaller dynamic than the lower flute because this is intended just to um, add a little bit of shine on the top this register for the flute is very is very clear um, and uh, strong actually and uh, if we were to have it at the same dynamic I wonder uh, should I bother changing well no I'll just I'll just tell you if we were to have it at the same dynamic um, uh, this would cut a lot more. As it is, we really just want this sound with a tiny bit of shimmer on it. Hear the difference? Right? We're, we still feel like the melody is here in this range, um, but because this little uh, upper line here, it has a little bit of brightness on it. And that's so nice. Okay, I'm uh, uh, spending too long talking about all the little details along the way, but this gives you an idea of how I've treated the main sound. Uh, let's move on to some of the supportive elements. Um, 
So could, remember, we've got uh, uh, three horns and a trumpet in here. We've got a little bit of clock and spiel, and then we've got a uh, pizzicato double bass doing its thing. Let's listen to just this layer, and I think we might expand the filter back out to show um, how it's interacting with the main sound. So what's interesting is you can kind of hear the ghost of the melody working here Ooh, um, in the trumpet, right? Uh, you can hear the trumpet is kind of outlining some of the same notes. I am using the trumpet as a, a, a resonator um, here. And um, the easiest way to think of that is um, if you've you know played an acoustic piano, you've got that nice lush pedal on the on the right that you press down and it sustains everything for you um, it lets the whole instrument resonate and it lets notes last longer uh, the orchestra does not have a sustain pedal of course so you need to write in when you want notes to ring um, and i'm using the trumpet here to help notes ring let's unfilter for a bit um so here, look, the strings have a quarter note and a rest, and the trumpet is holding on a little bit longer so it can be part of the uh, brass accompaniment chord. Um, but also, you know, thinking about a trumpet in an actual room, right, it's going to resonate a bit longer than that note as well. Um, I'm just making this melodic idea Um, last a little bit longer. Let's hear it without the trumpets. And then with the trumpet again. It's subtle, but it's definitely there, right? Um, that's what I find so fascinating about studying the craft of orchestration. These little, little tiny things Little tiny things add up to um, the desired effect. Um, let's talk a little bit about what the accompaniment in the horns is doing relative to the melody. Let's just go ahead and grab maybe you and you and boop, new filter. Love that. Uh, can we zoom in for you a little bit? Yeah. So let's look at rhythmically what's happening. We've got uh, this rhythm, doo -doo -woo. and then when it is silent, the little comment. Then the response, when it is silent, the comment. Then here, uh, again, this line is lasting longer in the uh, melody, and then the comment is lasting longer as well, but it's still starting on that beat too. So we get melody, melody has landed, and then a component um uh, supportive structure comments on it same pattern repeating through here it's familiar um it's the same uh uh rhythmic pattern both times just with some more information let's listen to just these together Oh, just like we were talking about the upper flute um, before, you know, as this uh, upper violin was was quite high, um, it is uh, doing basically the same thing um, where the viola has the uh, has the line in its proper range, and then um, this is just adding more shimmer on top. Talking about resonance with the trumpet again. Uh, here, it's holding that E out as the melodic line proper descends. Let's listen to just this bit here. Uh, 
right? So you can hear that uh, that upper note, that E, held out for a little bit longer to make it um, uh, you know feel feel like the whole thing is is ringing a little bit. Let's listen again. And it's it's holding on up top. Um, da, 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 da. Same thing is happening here uh, with the C, which is going to be the third of the A flat chord we land on uh, for this line here. Let's go ahead and do this. Hear it? Yeah, it's a nice effect. Um, not much else to talk about here, I don't think. The horns, um, they are providing you the harmonic context. Not much else to say, really. Um, There, we're not worrying about um, parallel fifths or things like that in this layer. Because um, everybody's, everybody's yelling like, ooh, parallel fifths are bad. Ooh, don't do parallel fifths. The, the purpose behind this rule, as it were, is it comes from Baroque principles. It comes from polyphonic principles, where if your intent is for lines to feel independent and be followable as independent voices, then uh, having them move together in parallel octaves or parallel fifths, these very um, smooth, open, locked-in intervals, the sounds begin to fuse together as a unit. And if your intent is to write independent voices, that's going to counteract your intent. If, however, your intent is to write something that feels like a single unit, then parallelisms like that can be your friend. Um, so in a layer like this where, you know, I don't want the sound to feel like three separate horns doing independent things. I want the horns to feel like a section that is moving together, articulating this harmonic information. Um, we're all, we've almost looked at everybody. I think the last thing is going to involve, that's right, um, the double bass and the glockenspiel. So, uh, the double bass pizzicato is supporting, uh, the horns here. We can hear that. Rather than having a trombone do it, um, you know, I sort of already knew what all the strings were doing, and double bass pizzicato just seemed like an appropriate way to give the um, the horns generally have a, a kind of a soft attack, um, and the plucking of the double bass gives it a little bit more boom. Just makes makes that texture a little bit more noticeable each time it appears. Um, the pizzicato also has a natural decay, um, which I feel like is kind of appropriate for uh, uh, this type of accompaniment. Okay, and then what's happening here? Here again, these are kind of outlining some of the um, uh, particular notes of the melody that we want to enhance. Um, let's go maybe U and I don't know, U, filter to these guys. You can hear that little twinkle on top. Uh, notice how different it is without that little twinkle. It feels um, much smoother. Um, 
it's lost that little twinkle, obviously, because we turned it off. And when I say smoother, part of what I'm talking about here is um, giving the giving the right beats of this phrase emphasis. Um, when I say smooth, this whole line sort of sounds fairly even. Let's listen again. Fairly even. And then with this little, uh, with this little twinkle on top. It's hitting some of the notes that I want to be emphasized just slightly more for us to parse the musical grammar of this phrase. Um, for instance, um, uh, this is uh, an A-flat uh, harmony in the ensemble, and we're going to land on an A-flat harmony in the ensemble. And this downbeat um, is just a little embellishment uh, underneath that C note, it's not as important as the two um, A flat chords around it. So I'm trying to bring out this outline. You can he see this um, outlines the A flat triad uh, with the use of the Kogenspiel and some of the other elements. Um, we'll hit this one more time. Um, see if you can hear that. Uh, these little waypoints that the Kalkenspiel is um, hitting on, and then we'll listen to the whole thing again and, and call it a day, because I've been talking too long. Nice. Uh, you may be wondering why uh, we transition from 3, 4 to 7, 8 and back a few times. Um, I wanted just a little bit of extra time here. That's the answer. Um, remember, music is about, uh, is once described um, quite beautifully as uh, uh, how we decorate time. Um, but a lot of music is, is really about um, manipulating our perception of time. Uh, playing with time as a dimension. And so it's really, really important that if in the process of your writing, you find yourself wishing that you had a little bit more time, write yourself in a little more time. I gave myself um, an extra eighth note. Um, I used it as a little bit of a pause after um, the this phrase. Um, just to give us a tiny bit of a lift before the second half starts. Uh, whoops, let's see. It's really barely perceptible, but um, you would absolutely notice if, let's go ahead and nudge these ever so slightly. Oh boy, that's a bad idea. Maybe I won't. Uh, oh. Maybe we could do that. Yeah. So you'll notice if it sounds uh, like this, for example. Right? That little bit of extra time we've taken. It's just enough time for the listener to kind of process um, that big harmony that just happened, the section that just happened, and then say, okay, got it. And by the time we've said, okay, I've got it, now we're hearing the next phrase. Um, yeah, I felt a pause there, so I wrote a pause there. Let's unfilter everything and uh, think about our lives <laughs> uh, as we listen to this whole thing one more time, and then uh, we'll call it a day for today. Nice. Uh, I hope that was interesting uh, or informative or both. 
probably both. Um, and uh, I hope to see you again next time because uh, I do want to, you know, share a little bit more of the process behind some of the things that I'm putting out for you to listen to. So ask um, any questions at all in the comment section below, uh, as desired, and uh, I will do my best to um, take a look and answer them. Um, otherwise, uh, have a great day. See you later.